In this video, we're going to compare Nginx and traffic reverse proxies. We'll measure CPU, memory usage, as well as latency and traffic. We'll run multiple tests, including routing plain HTTP traffic from the upstream service, HTTPS, which uses HTTP2 protocol, and gRPC. To be honest, I was slightly surprised how they handle traffic at the breaking point. Especially, I didn't expect huge differences in handling gRPC compared to regular HTTP traffic. Let's go over the setup first. We'll use Terraform to create VPC and provision a few EC2 instances. As a backend for proxies, for the first two tests, we'll use Golang Fiber framework to create a simple HTTP API. For the third test, we'll use a gRPC framework and create a simple RPC service. Then we'll configure Nginx and traffic to proxy those requests to the client. And we'll use the K6 testing framework to measure the latency. Of course, to collect metrics for CPU and memory usage, we'll deploy Prometheus and scrape the targets. Now, for the first plain HTTP test, the client initiates a connection with the proxy using HTTP 1 protocol. Then the proxy terminates the TLS connection and creates a new one toward application. That's why if your application needs to know the actual IP address of the client, we need to add it to the header on the proxy site. Otherwise, our application will see the source IP in the request of the proxy, not the client. Then proxy establishes a new TCP connection with the service, also using HTTP 1 protocol. Next, when we use HTTPS from the client, we can actually upgrade HTTP 1 to the HTTP 2 protocol. HTTP 2 is almost always established using the secure HTTPS protocol. Then proxy terminates the HTTPS, decrypts the payload and sends it to the application unencrypted message using HTTP 1 protocol. Finally, when we use gRPC, it also can use HTTP 2 protocol. But the most significant difference here is the connection between the proxy and the application. It can also also use HTTP2 protocol but using a different implementation which is called H2C which does not require TLS to establish HTTP2 connection. As always, for each new video, I upgrade all Terraform providers, libraries and third-party packages. So if you want to get up-to-date code and be up-to-date with all new technologies in the cloud space, subscribe to my channel. To create REST API, we use Golang and a Fiber framework with a single endpoint that returns 10 devices in JSON format. Now, gRPC uses proto buffers instead of JSON. It uses a binary format and and typically can be almost twice as smaller as equivalent JSON message. To create gRPC service, first we need to define the proto message. We have a device message with UUID, a MAC address and firmware version. Then we need to create a request object for the request. For example, we can ask for a specific device using its UUID. Finally, the manager service is equivalent to a REST endpoint in some way. It accepts the request and returns the device. To use it in the code, we need to generate a Go code based on this definition. To do that, you can use Proto-C compiler and point it to the Proto definition. Then we get the device struct to represent the hardware devices as well as get device service endpoint and associated methods to create gRPC server. gRPC framework also can load balance requests has a retries mechanism and other useful features. To create a gRPC server, we want to use generated code and define the get device method, in which we simply return the device that we created in the init method. Now, let's take a look at how to route all these requests using Nginx. For the first test, we'll define a server block to listen on port 80 and match api.nginx hostname. When we get the request, we forward it to the backend Golang application using either its IP address or a hostname. For the second HTTPS example, we not only need to listen on port 403 and use SSL option, but we must include HTTP2 to force Nginx to use HTTP2 protocol. By default, even with TLS, it will use HTTP1. Since I use self-signed certificates, I need to provide them here and forward a request to the Golang application. By the way, here you can add additional headers to include, for example, the IP address of the client to forward to Golang. You can obtain certificates using Let's Encrypt automatically if you want. 
For that, you need to install CertBot. It will detect the server block and convert it to TLS. Finally, we define the server block for gRPC service. Here, I also have self-signed certificates, but to forward it to backend, we use gRPC underscore path directive. By default, it will assume that your upstream gRPC service does not use TLS, but if it does, you need to include gRPC as prefix to your upstream URI. Next is a traffic proxy. First, I want to enable API dashboard, but do not expose it to the internet in production environments. Then we define the entry points similar to listen directive on the Nginx proxy. We want to expose Prometheus matrix on port 8082, then expose port 80 for HTTP and 443 for HTTPS. Notably, the traffic proxy is capable of using the same 443 port for both gRPC and HTTPS, when in Nginx we need to have two separate ports when we use TLS. Let's disable telemetry and version check. This file is called static configuration in traffic terminology. To discover upstream services, it has a bunch of providers, but we'll use the simplest one, which is called a file. Then the config file, which is called dynamic configuration. We can configure traffic to watch that file periodically as well. Now, when it comes to Prometheus metrics, we need to be very careful when defining histogram buckets. Since I tested it locally, on average, each request takes about 900 microseconds. I'll define corresponding buckets here. In one of the previous videos, we created a custom Prometheus Nginx exporter to extract service metrics from the access log. I will also use the same histogram buckets there. You can find it in the GitHub repo. Next, let's take a look at the dynamic configuration of the traffic. First of all, we need to define a service where we want to forward requests. Then create a route with rules. To use HTTPS, we need to include a TLS section with certificates or use built-in plugin to automatically issue certificates from Let's Encrypt. For HTTPS, we also need to create another route and specify the TLS section to indicate that we want to terminate TLS on the router and forward a plain HTTP request to the upstream service. Finally, similar gRPC service. If you use TLS on the gRPC itself, you would use H2 instead. And we also need another router to forward gRPC requests with the TLS section to terminate TLS. You can find more examples in the folder to reproduce the setup, not only for benchmarking, but for day-to-day -day operations. To run tests, we'll use key 6 load test tool for both HTTP and gRPC. In the first test, we'll spin up 5,000 virtual users in parallel to simulate a high load for 5 minutes. For proxies, I use T3A small EC2 instances. For the Golang upstream service, I use T3A large. And for the client where we run tests, I use T3A extra large. A similar test I have for traffic with the same parameters, just different URL. Let's go ahead and run both of them in parallel. What I noticed immediately that the memory usage of the Nginx stays on the same level, but traffic usage grows much higher. Then it looks like the CPU usage is almost the same. But by the time we reached 4000 virtual users, the traffic latency skyrocketed to 400 milliseconds compared to 1 or 2 milliseconds for the Nginx. It looks like Nginx can handle a larger number of requests without degradation in performance, but actually they handle load entirely differently at the breaking point. Now, I know that you can optimize and configure these proxies for a specific workload, but the majority of people, even in large corporations, will use default settings as I do here in these tests. Now, if we switch back to the terminal, we can see that traffic tries to serve every single request that it gets, even if it causes huge latency. Nginx instead drops requests to keep normal operation and keep latency low. That's the most significant difference in how they handle high loads. If we wait till the end of the test, we can see that the maximum CPU usage for the traffic has increased to about 82% when the CPU usage for the Nginx is only 76%. And of course, a big difference in memory usage. At the end of the test, we can see that P90 and P95 for Nginx are way smaller. As a reminder, P95, for example, represents 95% of all requests that completed under this duration. So for 
for Nginx P95 is 130 milliseconds, while for the traffic it is 445 milliseconds. The huge difference is mainly because Nginx simply drops the requests when it knows when it's overloaded. What I found is that custom Prometheus exporter actually consumes a lot of CPU because it needs to process all 5000 log entries every second and parse metrics from them. On the large instance it could be fine, but for these tests it makes a huge difference. Now let me disable Prometheus Nginx exporter and rerun the test. Since we're not going to get latency from the Nginx anymore, let's make CPU and memory graphs larger. We still can get the latency from the K6 client, which is actually much more accurate since it's calculated on the client side. Let's rerun the test without exporter. Now you can notice that the difference in CPU usage of the traffic and Nginx is significant. The blue line is for traffic and the green line for Nginx. At the end of the test, we see similar proportions between Nginx and traffic, but in this test Nginx didn't actually drop any requests. Next, let's run the benchmark test for HTTPS. It should be a more CPU intensive test, so I limited the number of virtual users to only 1000 from the 5000 from the previous test. In this test, proxies must decrypt every single request and then forward them to the upstream service. The memory usage is lower just because we decreased the number of clients, but the CPU usage difference is still significant between Nginx and the traffic when it comes to terminating TLS connections. In the results, you can see that Nginx P95 is only 3.5 milliseconds, while for traffic it is around 16.5 milliseconds. Finally, let's run the test for gRPC. Both proxies still need to terminate the TLS connection and then use HTTP2 protocol to forward requests to the upstream gRPC server. Here I was surprised, cause we have the same 1000 virtual users, but it takes much more CPU to process the equivalent number of requests compared to just JSON over HTTP2, even though RPC messages are much smaller. Here are the tests, plain HTTP with Prometheus exporter, then the same test but with disabled Prometheus exporter, HTTPS that requires TLS termination, and finally gRPC. Well, I wasn't surprised by Nginx performance, but I didn't expect that gRPC would take so much more CPU to process the requests. Maybe because in HTTPS test I return 10 devices as an array, but in gRPC I return a single device. But since K6 distribute load similarly during the 5 minutes, the gRPC should even take less CPU to process requests, since the requests are much, much smaller. Maybe I need to run more tests in the future to compare JSON over HTTP2 and gRPC. If you have any ideas for designing the test, please let me know. I have another video where I compare Golang versus Rust and Golang versus Node.js. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.